to do some infrared spectroscopy, really important, well, important across all of chemistry, important at A level. It's one of the content of the course that works towards identifying by analysing information about, well, almost always organic chemicals. Basis of it is it uses part of the electromagnetic spectrum, EMS over there. Um, pretty much the entirety of the electromagnetic spectrum does a form of spectroscopy for chemistry. And uh, not all of them are used in the A-level syllabuses that I'm aware of. Radio waves affect matter in a very uh, subtle way. Um, and it is termed nuclear magnetic resonance. It's also the basis of MRI scanners. Microwaves do a type of spectroscopy that's not at A-level. It uh, rotates molecules, rotational spectroscopy. Infrared, which is the obviously the title for today, is also termed vibrational spectroscopy because that's what it does. It, produces vibrations in molecules, although vibrations really being an oscillation rather than a vibration, but you'll see that when we get to the dance section. You may have noticed they've got the haircut especially for this video. Finally the uh, barbers are open. Uh, ultraviolet, oh sorry, light, this light out. Light we're familiar with, it gives us the colour of compounds, uh, particularly transition metal compounds, but not exclusively. So light interplays with matter. There's an interaction with electromagnetic spectrum content and matter in some form or another. Light we see as the colour of compounds. And ultraviolet also does a type of spectroscopy, but not in the A-level course. So the ones with a tick have a role to play in A-level courses. X-rays, I've kind of put it in brackets because you don't specifically go on about the X-rays, but it does do, when people go, we've analysed it and we know the crystal structure, it's done by X-rays. So, crystallography, X-rays, terribly difficult thing to understand. When you look at what you think, how on earth did all those dots turn into a crystal structure? And the other thing is, it does what's called electron diffraction or electron density, which is where you find the electron locations within substances. I don't doubt that there is a gamma ray uh, spectroscopy of some kind. I don't know anything about it, so I've not put anything in it and I don't know I'm going to say anything about it. But today is about infrared. So that's a, a very uh, key component of A level courses, NMR. Infrared. Again, very important, and these two, lesser so. So, once you well, we focus on the infrared, because that's what we're here for. Uh, infrared, it, it's about changing the dipole in a molecule. Okay, so if you're making your notes, which I hope you are, because otherwise why am I doing this? You might need to be pausing and writing down what's going on. So we are talking here, changing the dipole changing the dipole in a molecule. Now, two possibilities for that. A lot of molecules have a permanent dipole, and if you change that permanent dipole, and this is what infrared will do, it will change, I'll, you'll see when we talk about them, the modes, there are six ways it can do this. But if you change, say the length of a bond, and if that bond carries part of the dipole, for instance, it will take the chlorine atom further away and the dipole within the molecule changes. 
So therefore, the changing of the dipole allows the infrared to be absorbed. It, it's kind of, I'm going to change the dipole, it absorbs the infrared. It is the other way around, but you tend to think of it as in the wrong direction. The other scenario is something that doesn't have a dipole, but by lengthening one of the bonds, you change the dipole from zero to actually having a dipole and then it goes back to having so as it perhaps lengthens because you tend to a lot of the infrared effects are lengthening bonds so you push an atom further away what was completely symmetrical something like ccl4 one of the chlorines gets further away the whole thing picks up a small dipole and then loses it again infrared absorption is taking place so that does mean there are certain things that are so simple, they do not absorb. So something that doesn't have a bond, noble gas, doesn't do anything with infrared, doesn't absorb it. Things like nitrogen with its triple bond, if you were to lengthen the bond, it doesn't cause a dipole because it's too simple a molecule. It just becomes two things separated by a different distance, but it's still symmetrical in every way. So it's a non-absorber. So other things, other diatomic gases they don't absorb in infrared either. But when we do look at things that are going to absorb in the infrared it causes six changes in the way the bonds are arranged in some form or another. Now to show you those with my arms but we're gonna to have to take a little edit to get ready to do it so I'll see you in just a moment so six modes I think is probably the right word of uh, infrared causing bonds to react to them resulting in a dipole change that results in the infrared being absorbed I think that's enough. Most of the time in A-level questions, it's not about how does infrared work. I can't recall the last time there was an A-level question that said, how does infrared spectroscopy work? Most of the time, we only go as far as there's a dipole change in the molecule results in the infrared being absorbed. That's enough. But we're just giving you a bit more of a background and a bit more detail. You may have noticed I'm lower. That's because I'm about to... Uh, show you the six modes. The six modes are written on the board up there. Kind of self-descriptive up to a point. Um, I'm not sure how whether those are just simple names um, to represent them or whether they're the official names. I don't think it really matters. Uh, there is accompanying this a uh, PowerPoint presentation that's got animated versions of this in that I have to say I got from a website that will be credited. I just can't remember which one it is. So here we go with what they are. You can do them with your arms. It kind of looks a bit dancey if you're kind of my age maybe. So symmetrical, I'm going to use my arms to represent what we are doing. Now it's not a terribly uh, useful, um, I don't even know whether I'm a completely in camera shot. There we go, I'm being pointed out by the camera per operator. Right, so symmetrical stretching goes like this. Now technically it doesn't bend at the elbow because it's a bond, but it's that kind of movement. A anti-symmetrical or asymmetrical sometimes stretching is this. It's like the football supporter on the way down the road. Then there's scissoring. Now scissoring is like the action of a pair of scissors. All right. Then rocking. Now rocking's like you've got a scarf at a, some kind of concert and you're going like this. So scissoring and rocking. Now they kind of go in pairs. So you've got that and a repair, the, that 
and that a repair. And then there's the, the bottom two which are wagging and twisting. Now I love wagging as a concept in terms of what it does to molecules because you get methyl groups being wagged so the whole methyl group does the wagging motion but I can't be a methyl group, I don't have three arms. But what happens with wagging, I can be an amine group in H2, here I am, wagging is coming back and forth and then Twisting is where one goes forward, one goes back. So there are the six modes done with the, uh, with the arms. Now at this point, what I would like you to do is like you to join with me doing the dance. Here we go. order they were. See you after the edit. So I hope you enjoyed the little uh... okay you didn't right. Infrared machines again this is a very simplistic version of it they're much more sophisticated machines no school could afford one and it works by a comparative effect of infrared infrared don't forget it's just heat so it's just a a heat source producing the whole range of infrared and it's split into two. They do that with a spinning mirror. So we have a mirror on a motor. And it and there's a, obviously there's going to be a mirror here to change the direction of the infrared beam. But what you do is you run the infrared beam straight through the, the air and you detect it. Now the detection stuff is quite clever these days, it's called Fourier transform, but we don't have to get into all of that. So we literally, we say, oh, we just detect the infrared. And then all you do with the other half of the beam is that you send it down through S for your sample of whatever it is you're testing and detect it. And then all you do in the machine, and the machine does it all for you, is it makes a comparison between the two. And any difference comes out of the machine. There's a graphical representation to say there's been some absorption of the infrared compared to the beam where there's nothing in the way. So when you do that, there's always absorption to a degree because you've got a substance in the way and the container that it may be in. And then at particular times it absorbs significantly more strongly, sometimes very strongly, and that way you get the spectroscopy, so you get a series of absorptions of the infrared by the material in the sample. And in doing that, those absorptions are at characteristic energies. Like a lot of things in chemistry, things happen at specific energies and anything with a slightly different energy doesn't cause those things. It's that quantized effect again. And when you do this, you get a series of characteristic absorptions. Now the number of those is quite vast. But, fortunately for A-level, the limit is probably, you could say, about five will get you through if you understand a few things about those. And we need to do that because most of the A-level questions are not about how you do infrared or what infrared does. It's about, can I identify components of a molecule? So that's the remaining of the focus of what we need to do, but I need to get the board ready for that. I'll see you in a moment. Okay, so when you look at an infrared spectrum, it's presented as a drop down from the top rather than an absorption going up from the bottom. There's no, no reason for it not being the other way other than all the machines seem to do it this way so everybody gets used to it being this way. This sketch sketch is the right word, covers four out of the five things in terms of infrared and linking it to molecules that you need to know. I didn't get them all in one go. Now there's something you need to be aware of and that's the unit. Now you look at the numbers across the top 
they go from 4,000, actually the spectrum continues down to about here uh, at about 200 if you've got an expensive machine. Now the scale is not even, uh, the scale is gets different from here to here and here to here normally. So, but we, we just look at the numbers. We don't actually make measurements of the numbers, we just go, what number is it? Okay, right, we'll go with that. So when you look at this spectrum, what are you seeing? Well, you're seeing a string of numbers across the top with a stupid unit. I think it's a stupid unit. Uh, it's, I know why they do it. They do it to give you numbers that are manageable in your head. This represents the energy of the absorption, but it's in an odd unit. The unit is centimetres to the minus one. Now what that means is it's one divided by the wavelength, but the wavelength has to be measured in centimetres. It just gives you a sensible number between 4,000 and 200, rather than an energy of a really tiny energy or frequency with a massive number with standard form. It is just to make them up, the numbers more manageable. In terms of the unit, you look at it and go, what on earth? Centimetres to the minus one. There you go. So it's called I have to say, for me, I have no idea why it's called wave number. It just is, and I you just remember it as that. Now, when you look at that, it starts off there. And that's the large wave number, and it comes down to 1,000. You notice I've got a dotted line there. What happens in infrared spectra, being the plural of spectrum, is that you get a series of discrete, obvious things going on. And then when you get to 1,000, it goes nuts. It goes chaos. It's like... <laughs> Pinks everywhere, absorption is all over the place. This has the name fingerprint region. I'll come back to that in just a second. Here is the more character, I don't know what the name of that is, but it's where you look in your questions. So anything over a thousand is game for interpreting, anything less than a thousand, ignore because it just looks crazy down there. So when you see an infrared spectrum, it'll be quite, uh, certainly in A-level, because they are a bit simplified at A-level, it'll be quite obvious what's going on here, and then there'll just be loads and loads of things going on down here that you don't look at. Now, when you look at these, always the same bonds. Now, does it have to be organic? No. Is it going to be organic at A-level? I think so. So it's going to be from, taken from the organic bonding book of bonds that you will be looking. There isn't a book of bonds, but you know what I mean. So when you look at this, most of the peaks you see are quite sharp. Now, I'm reading about this just before I did this, and they say it's called tongue and sword analysis. I thought that was interesting. These are swords. That's a double-bladed sword with a weird pointy bit on it. That's quite common to see that. So these are swords. This is a tongue. Uh, the tongue, because it's, uh, you, can't call, oh, you can't call it a tongue in your exam, uh, is broad. Now, the interesting thing is when you look at certain courses, that they have a, we all have a data book, and some of the data books talk about whether it's sharp, or which is a sword, or wide, which is a tongue. Other ones don't mention it. But you have to remember that that broad one there, represents that bond. Now you find that bond in two ways in organic samples. One, there's an OH bond in there. The other one is you left your sample wet and it's got water in it because water's got an OH bond in there. So if you get an unexpected OH bond, it probably won't be as massive as that. It will be up there because there's not very much water so the absorption is quite small. But it'll be in the same place. So this positioning, around about 3,500 wave number, is an OH bond. You find it in alcohols, you find it in carboxylic acids, you find it in phenols and a few other things. So this here represents a CH bond. They are stretches. They are stretching of the, uh, the, the hydrogen taking itself further away and coming back in both of those cases. This here represents the most important one that you see in almost all in, in so much of the questions are based around this one. The 
people call it a carbonar. You'll find it in carboxylic acids, ketones, aldehydes, amides, uh, acid anhydrides, azyl chlorides. It's just in so many compounds. And this here represents one of the characteristic absorptions of a, an al in an alkene. So, Carbonyl absorption is really helpful because that's supposed to be 50. I managed to make it up, put the wrong digit in. Because when it's in that region as a carbonyl, where it is in that region tells you what type of carbonyl it is. That's why it's really helpful. So if it's at a certain value, it means it's an acid, it's an azyl chloride. If it's another value, it means it's a ketone. If it's a slightly different value, it might mean it's an ester, which is another functional group. Have a carbon on it. This here is about 1600. Don't write the numbers down. You don't need to remember, they're in your data book. Let. So you don't need to do that. The whole point of infrared is that you can use your data booklet because it's there in the exam and you cross reference between it and the spectrum in the exam question and go, it's got this bond, it's got this bond, it hasn't got this bond and it gives you pieces of evidence about the identity of an unknown compound because that's going to be the question pretty much guaranteed. You're going to get a question where you have to identify a compound and there'll be a collection of information and you have to piece it all together. One of the things may well be infrared spectroscopy. Do you look at the bonds? OH is always wide. Everything else, narrow. Everything else is a sword, as I saw. So, really, that's kind of it. That's a generic drawing of a... Well, actually, that would be a carboxylic acid that's got an unsaturated part of the carbon chain. That's what that would be. The only other bond that... Not that common in infrared questions is an amine bond. Amine bonds are up here in the same sort of area as the OH. It's because of the nitrogen and oxygen being electronegative. And they are, again, listed in the data book. So the five bonds that you're likely to get in an A-level question that you have to identify and are, are these five here, including that one which I've not got in the infrared spectrum. This is not very helpful. It does have a little bit of left and right, depending on what you find around it, but it's not that clear. And of course, C to H bonds in organic compounds, which is just loads of them, because that's one of the basis of organic chemistry. Result being not terribly helpful. C that, massively helpful, you've got an OH. C one of those, very uncommon in terms of A-level questions. That's likely to be in the question, because it's really diagnostic for what type of compounds you've got. Occasionally you see the alkene ones, less so. What about the fingerprint region? And you do sometimes get a question about the fingerprint region, but it's not about what's going, what are the numbers in there. What it is, is with the fingerprint region is when you want to absolutely identify, oh, it's this compound, but this name, you then go, there's the infrared spectrum of my compound, and you look up the infrared spectrum of the compound in a reference book and if it matches in the fingerprint region you've got an identical match that's the name of the compound so it's used for absolute identification by comparison to a reference set of infrared spectra on the other hand if you made a compound for the first time it's not going to be in the book is it so there we go but that's kind of it that's it now with this there is a couple of things one there was some further information with some explained infrared spectra, which you will need to print out and uh, read and see why it says what it does. There's a PowerPoint presentation that's got a few little further pieces of information in it, including the animations of the uh, dancey stuff using a, a molecule model and where I got them from. And then there are some 
pretty straightforward questions because I can't do the whole analysis of a, mole of a, a molecule thing because there's a whole load of other things that you need to bring together. It's kind of a thing you need to be doing in a classroom. And there we are. So they're fairly straightforward questions to practice on. The answers will be there with it. It's not something that uh, is terribly difficult. You will need a data booklet. You'll need to obtain the data booklet that goes with your exam course. Because otherwise you won't be able to uh, look at the numbers. Because you need to get used to doing that because that's what you'll have to do under the pressure of the exam. Thank you very much. I will see you for whatever I choose to do next. Hope you like my new haircut. See you soon. Bye.